Well, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's uh, Grant Ellis, CFO of Restaurant Brands, and uh, Russell Creedy uh, is our CFO. We'll do a, uh, our CEO. Sorry, uh, we'll do a, a bit of a, um, a dog and, and pony show. Um, uh, we're um, and I'm conscious too. We have a mix of sort of um, restaurant brands understandings in here. Some who I recognise from our regular briefings, and I apologise for those that. Uh, are in that category, and for those that aren't, um, we'll uh, we'll attempt to uh, sort of give you a bit of a um, a sort of a un introduction. So the purpose of this, I'll I'll talk about. I'll give a sort of restaurant brands 101. Those familiar with the stock can uh, quietly doze or go and have a coffee, um, and a brief trading update, which is really, as you know, we only did our half year sort of four six weeks ago. So there's not too much more we can add on that. So we'll reinforce that. Then Russell will get into. Uh, a bit more of the meat of the challenges and strategies around our four brands and a bit of an, uh, a view on Outlook. Um, Restaurant Brands 101, um, we're a corporate franchisee. A lot of people struggle to understand uh, franchisee. They think uh, we own the brands or we have uh, franchisees that, re uh, that work to us. Uh, no, we uh, simply uh, we operate uh, four brands in New Zealand, obviously KFC, Pizza Hut, Starbucks Coffee, and more recently, Carl's a junior. Uh, we own the stores, pay the people, pay the creditors, take the sales in, and we pay a uh, percentage in royalties uh, to uh, Yum, Yum Brands for our KFC and Pizza Hut businesses, uh, CKE Enterprises for our Carl's Junior businesses, and Starbucks Coffee International for our um, uh, for our Starbucks businesses. So we pay out about sort of 18 million odd dollars a year in royalties, and uh, for that a considerable sum, we get the right to put the, the names above the door and, uh, and access to the Colonel's secret recipe and, um, uh, and a little bit of uh, product development. Um, you can see amongst the, uh, amongst the brands, KFC is the 600 pound gorilla in our stable and, uh, and we'll, you'll get a bit more of a feel for that uh, later on in terms of the strategy we're embarking on with Carl's Jr. Uh, there's our sort of first half sales revenues for, for this year. You can see KFC right up there at uh, uh, three quarters of, uh, of the total, total uh, sales and indeed the vast bulk of our earnings. Uh, KFC f um, uh, for uh, full year last year produced EBITDA about 45 million against 4 million for Pizza Hut, 3 million for Starbucks and sort of negative um, half a million for Carl's Jr. So, KFC is still the big 100-pound uh, gorilla, um, but the plan is to move that purple segment uh, up uh, as a percentage of our total sales uh, and earnings uh, quite quite rapidly. Um, I did say we uh, we operate our own stores, but we also uh, have uh, uh, a I guess a mixed model in that there are a number of franchisees uh, that run those brands in New Zealand that we support, if you like, we are the sort of uh, act in loco parentis for the franchise or and particularly the Pizza Hut stores and uh, for those of you who are familiar with the stock, uh, there are 31, in fact I think their number is up a little bit more, independent Pizza Hut franchisees for whom we have sold the stores to over the last three years. Uh, their franchise agreements are with Yum, uh, but we have a separate agreement with Yum where we clip the ticket on royalties and um, supply chain and marketing and so forth uh, and they operate their stores uh, where we keep an eye on them. And again, Russ will talk a bit, a bit more about that strategy and our Pizza Hut business. Seven KFC franchisees, uh, those franchisees have been there forever. Uh, they actually were there before restaurant brands started. Similar arrangements, their franchise agreements are with Yum, but they participate in our marketing and um, uh, as part of the, the whole, whole market. Uh, we're currently in the process of buying a number of those back. Those guys have done very well over the years, a lot of them looking to retire, so we're, we've actually bought one last year and uh, there are others we're having a look at. And there's one Carl's Jr. franchisee, and very briefly, Carl's, the Carl's Jr. brand uh, was established in New Zealand not by us, but by another independent operator, a guy called Barry Forsgren, who those of you familiar did it in partnership with a guy called Michael Jones, the ex All Black. Um, and he built the first two stores before we got started. Um, 
but we now have the, the rights for all of New Zealand and uh, Barry's capped out <coughs> at uh, eight stores. But again, we have relationships where we work with him in building the brand in, in New Zealand. Uh, restaurant brands, just a bit of uh, financial background. Um, one of the great things about this company as a CFO is that uh, it's uh, um, no stock, no debtors. It's uh, working capital is absolute minimum. We, we, we get the, the dollars in uh, the front door and then you know next month on the 20th of the month we pay the creditors. The following week we pay the staff. So it's a sort of negative working capital kind of environment. It's a wonderful uh, situation to be in. So the good thing, I'm afraid the graph's a bit small there, but hopefully you can see very strong cash flows from operating activities, $30, $35 million a year. Um, we do reinvest quite strongly back in the brands. Um, and you can see investing uh, $14 million in 2012, $20 million in 2013, and $3 million in 2014. Uh, just keep in mind that from those investing activities, uh, we have been uh, selling um, um, a number of pizza stores, so those numbers are net, of course. So the gross number uh, was about another, I think, $4 million higher in 2013 and about a $9 million higher in 2014. So strong operating cash flows, um, investing activities, uh, we do heavily invest, and Russell will talk a little bit more about our KFC investment um, history, uh, but obviously at the moment we're also investing heavily in our building our Carl's Junior brand. And, uh, and there's sort of plenty of free cash flow in terms of uh, dividends. So uh, we dividends per share for the last uh, three, three, well sorry, last two years, 16 and a half, 16 and um, nine and a half. So um, we do pay out a fair chunk of our earnings in dividends, all fully imputed, uh, keeps the shareholders happy. Uh, just a, a sort of a brief conceptual overview of, uh, of the company, very simple structure. We've got a head office or support centre with uh, 88 in total, of which I think about 25 of those are field staff, aren't they? So, so um, that, that probably that number's a little bit over, overstated. There's 20, 25 of those 88 are actually out in the field, so they, they shouldn't actually be in head office, they should be out amongst the stores. Uh, so effectively sort of 65 odd people in an office environment and from that head office staff we provide all of services for the store. So it's marketing, it's HR, it's IS, it's accounting, payroll, store development, maintenance, um, training, everything else. So the theory is that the store managers can concentrate on just one thing and that's selling the chicken, the pizza, the coffee and the burgers. Um, and there's no other uh, offices, no other levels in the organisation apart from the head office or these area managers. And then we've got our 90 KFC stores, uh, currently 52 Pizza Hut stores, 27 Starbucks and 7 Carl's Jr. So total staff just under 4,000, of which again you can see the vast bulk of KFC, 2,500, 600 odd in Pizza Hut, 300 odd in Starbucks and Carl's Jr. building rapidly with just over 300. So I think the, the point uh, here is uh, we are, uh, our sort of core competency, if you like, is bringing brands in and leveraging New Zealand experience, expertise to uh, any number of fast food uh, brands. And eventually the, the sort of vision is to have a bit like a Microsoft screen with you know, lots of brands across the, across the bottom, more than uh, the four we've, we've got. And uh, we've seen that with Carl's Jr., one of the good things about bringing Carl's Jr. to this country was that CKE Enterprises, the franchisor, was very, very keen to do business with us because anybody that wants to bring a chain of fast food or cha a food chain to New Zealand, we're sort of the first point of, point of call um, as we have the experience, the expertise, and most importantly, the, the leverage because you don't need a new CEO, you don't need another payroll manager, you don't need another um, marketing general manager and so forth to bring another brand uh, into, the, into the country. So very briefly, uh, just sort of tra trading uh, update. This, these are the first half 2014 results, which again, uh, a number of you would have seen or been uh, privy to our discussions. Um, uh, group revenues up 5.3%, uh, so $176 million for the first half of this year, uh, up 5.3%, uh, the vast bulk of which was the Carl's Jr. growth, $6.6 .6 million in Carl's Jr. sales, 
kicked in for the first half of this year and that brand will, is continuing to add sales very rapidly. But base business still strong, same store sales for the first half 2.9%. Um, and that so uh, we're reasonably happy that even in the current environment we're still driving sales and uh, that in particular was uh, Pizza which was uh, continues to perform strongly. Impact uh, excluding non-trading uh, we tend to talk uh, exclude for those unfamiliar with the stock we back out what we call our non-trading uh, items which for instance in the first half of this year we made $1.1 $1 .1 million million dollars on sale and lease back of a couple of stores uh, we tend to sort of back that out of our trading because really what the market's interested in is what your money you're making out of selling your chicken and your pizza and your coffee, etc. So, uh, so non-trading 8.8 million for the first half, a reported impact uh, 9.7. So, um, but you can see how that number goes up and down, whereas the sort of fundamental business um, <coughs> is, uh, is holding largely flat. Brandy but da up slightly, uh, pizza at... Uh, contributed strongly, KFC was slightly down, and dividends stable on prior year. And you can see that uh, Carl's Jr. is starting to uh, build some momentum. Uh, morning, I'm going to talk a bit more about just the operations themselves, cash generators. Um, so firstly KFC, KFC is the, the big gorilla obviously, uh, the big strong cash generator. First half 129 million, uh, sales are up 1.8, now that is uh, consequence primarily of buying additional store and opening a, one extra store. Um, same store sales, if you back those out, was just below flat for first half for KFC. Um, and um, strong EBITDA. Um, we have a target of around 20%. We, um, uh, we've made known that we're fairly comfortable with that as a, as a long-term target. Right now we're a bit below that. But it's very much a cyclical um, uh, a number that will be around that 18 to 20 and above 20 over the long term. Um, depends a bit on price of chicken, price of international feed, when feed prices go down, which they're starting to do right now. If you follow um, the Chicago Board of Trade, you'll see there's quite a drop, soy is dropping, and that's really good for us because 40% uh, of the cost of chicken is in feed, so you, know, you, you get these rapid fluctuations and, and, and quite large swings in, um, in the base cost of the business. At the moment we've gone through a, a pretty high period by, uh, by any, any year's standards that I've seen over the last sort of 12, 14 years. Um, assets, assets employed about 65 million um, for you know, the ratio of EBITDA to assets employed, pretty strong business. And what are we spending our money on? The main thing about KFC is we transformed the business starting back in 2005. Um, so the, uh, the bottom line, the black line, uh, is when we started spending on transformation. And it's, it's bobbed around uh, up to about 10 million each year. We've spent on completely re-imaging <coughs> the stores. So some cases we've scraped the ground and rebuilt a new store. Other times we've stripped it out and used the shell and spent anywhere between 500,000 up to 2 million, depending on the size of the project. Uh, and that started in 2005 with our first transform store down in Hamilton, Frankton, and we've continued that program for a number of years. The, uh, the more interesting thing is how the red line moved, sales. As soon as we started this program, the brand kicked and it just kept flying. Uh, and, and there's a few reasons why. Re-image, brands more than 40 years in the country, people needed a new, a new look and feel, uh, transform some service issues uh, or the service offering uh, and menu. We also had, had a good go at redesigning uh, what we were presenting on the menu. We've shifted menu mixes away from just buckets of chicken to more burgers and wraps and, and other products and that's a continuing program that we'll, we'll uh, maintain. And EBITDA kicked with it. So uh, you can see over the last yeah, year or two, a bit of flat point, but as I say, that's primarily driven through those input costs on uh, on chicken, and I expect that to uh, to swing around again. Uh, if we look at KFC's challenges, um, it's, a, it's a it's a big business, it's stable. Um, we do a round numbers, 250 million for the year. Um, target I have is is around 300 million for it. Uh, it doesn't take a hell of a lot to get there. Uh, if you looked at the average store sales 
of say about $52,000, $53,000 per week on average uh, across the, every store in the country. Um, you just need to get that to $60 million and uh, 60000 a week. And you, know, you very quickly add these numbers up. So the big kick in sales that you saw in, in those earlier graphs, KFC had been locked in the sort of $40,000 a week sales trend for quite a few years. Started the transformation process and we got this big kick that rocketed us up above 50. And for many years now we've been above $50,000 per week average. Um, so maintaining that and maintaining same store sales uh, growth, even though it will be small, is, is really a key um, measure of, of uh, the success of the business. I mentioned earlier the return on EBITDA, the target is above 20%. At the moment we're probably going to be around 19 hopefully for the year. Um, and and that's, um, uh, that'll come and go. We have it a year, I think we did 22 or something. Uh, or above that, so it's, uh, it's likely to happen again. Uh, a lot of that, uh, that pressure on, on, on the margin has been driven through discounting. Um, so chicken price is going the wrong way uh, and a very, very competitive market. I read in today's paper, one of our competitors is uh, feeling sad for the second year in a row, they've lost more money. Um, and um, that's just indicative of what they're doing in the market, discounting themselves into oblivion. And um, fortunately, we are not in that position. KFC is part of, uh, I think, the world's population's DNA. Uh, people love it to that extent. Everybody declares, I never eat KFC. Meantime, around the corner, they'll pop in and always have a bit of KFC at some stage. So it's, it's one of those things that is just irresistible. <laughs> and uh, I love the brand, and I'm sure you all do. <laughs> you don't have to admit it, but uh, boy, we have plenty of closet KFC eaters out there and uh, if uh, KFC has uh, I heard somebody saying you know how many customers one of the high-tech companies they were not any high-tech companies but you know they're proud they've got 10,000 customers um, that's cool when you're selling them $30 service per month whatever KFC's customers in New Zealand is 15 and a half to 16 million per year I mean, that's how many we churn through and serve it's, it's it's a lot of customers a lot of touch points and a lot of people obviously love us so um, very good business to be in. Um, rolling out the next phase, the third point of stores. If you go via Auckland Airport, you'll see there's a new Coles Junior and a new KFC uh, at the entrance to, to the airport. Um, that KFC is the new image that we're moving to. So we've gone through phase one transformation. We're now <coughs> going through phase two, which is uh, somebody coined the name transfusion. I don't know why, but anyway, it's injection of new life and blood into it. And New Zealand is generally considered a, a leader in the world for KFC design. Uh, every now and again, the, the guys from Dallas pop out and they have a look at our stores and, and they just go back gobsmacked at how well New Zealand does in innovating for the brand. Um, a few years ago, I had a, we had a conference in, in Europe and went off to Prague and toured around some of the Eastern Europe countries. And you could literally step inside a KFC store somewhere in Eastern Europe and you swear you're down in Onihanga or you know somewhere in a KFC here. They just copied our designs, colour palettes, everything exactly the same. That's how impactful our, our design has been. Um, it became this global standard for KFC worldwide. Um, they've taken it a bit further, but now we've taken it another step further again. And uh, we're very proud of that. So airport stores worth visiting. Um, we, the, the, the transformation um, process for the first phase will be completed in about two years. So everybody says, oh, what happens then? You know, the big grafting, this, what's going to happen? I think this phase two is the next next stage. Don't forget, some of these stores are already eight going on. It'll soon be ten years that they had their first facelift and, and redesign. And we're in a stage where we're adding new technology to the stores. We're going to complete digital menu panels. You'll some, see that at the, at the airport. Digital drive through uh, that's another first in the world, by the way. Uh, people do digital in-store, nobody does digital outdoor as well. And there's a, there's a lot of technic, technical issues around that with uh, air conditioning, weatherproofing, bulletproofing. Um, we, I, I can sweep by that. It's, uh, it holds up pretty well to a good slug, um, as some of our panels have been shot at. You get a bit of a dent, you know, a bit of a, a mark on it, but you can polish them off and I suppose they hit it right in the middle of my bracket but we haven't yet and, and they resist bricks 
Um, well, there's not a, a brick yet that has gone through one of them. So um, it's been tried by every hoodlum out there, but uh, they've held up well. Uh, moving on to Pizza Hut. Um, <coughs> sales, um, uh, the, the total sales are, are still positive. A um, bit of a change on, on, on last year. But the thing to remember here is we've uh, also been selling off a bunch of stores. And um, I wrote down 12 stores fewer than the year before. So with fewer stores, as we've sold them down, and more sales, that just shows what's happened in Pizza Hut. And I don't think it's, it's news to anybody that Pizza Hut has had a complete revival. Um, about a, just 18 months ago, so we decided to change tech completely, take on the competitors, take on the pizza category in its entirety, and basically just rewrite it. So we changed prices significantly, we changed the product. We went from a standard menu of about 42 products uh, uh, as listed, plus you could also do all your own, build your own. We dropped that down to 18, because uh, the reality is there's only three pizzas that actually sell. 80% of all volume, out of, no matter who, who who's above your door, what the name is, three pizzas are the, the core sellers. Uh, so we rationalised, simplified, changed the number of pan sizes, dough sizes, dough types, everything, down to a very simple thing and dropped the price. Leveraged labour, leveraged the assets, and we just turned the business around, and we've never looked back. It's uh, it's more than a KFC transformation than we did here. We didn't put anything into the assets, but boy, we really transformed what the brand represented to the customers. Again, to the extent where we have more visitors from Dallas coming down annoying me, because <coughs> they want to know what the hell you guys have done, because they've got problems in Mexico, UK, USA, Canada, wherever, Australia is a classic, wherever Pizza Hut's sort of done 30, 40, 50 years, it's hit the same sort of wall. People have got a bit tired of the brand, it's, it's lost its funk. Um, they, <coughs> they're looking for some revival. And what New Zealand has provided them is, is a, a segue to get in there and look at presenting a new option to customers. Because you can't just keep selling pizzas at $10 and hope customers are going to buy them no matter what the quality or the service is like. You've got to add something um, and that means taking other costs and that out of the business. So we did that very effectively. Um, rewrote the economics, second things, rewrote the economics for <coughs> the pizza category. Um, I think seriously damaged the competitor. Uh, to the point that I think there's a couple nine stores or so that's in insolvency at the moment. Had a look at their sites, not that interested because um, we've obviously got our sites next door or close by. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of competitors that are finding competing against Pizza Hut ain't a good idea anymore. So hopefully, you know they 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 grow up and um, leave town. Uh, Sides. So the, the challenges, um, again, maintaining the same store. We've hit two years in a row of about 19, almost 20 percent same store sales growth. Um, this year we thought it would come off and we told the analysts in our briefings, yeah, probably come off below 10. Um, <clears throat> yep, didn't, it stayed up high, so it's still pretty darn strong growth out there. And um, margins have improved quite dramatically in the business, so we, we've got a strong cash generating business very little investment required in it, and um, where the investment will be around the, the the web digital side of the business, which we we're moving quite strongly into. Um, but quite happy to keep the business in the portfolio and slowly sell off some of those regional stores and just continue with that program. Um, the the price that we're selling at has you know, gone up dramatically from when we first started that program. Number one, because sales are robust. We, uh, people are convinced that, yep, this brand has, has got, got a lot of strength. Um, obviously, the profit numbers, uh, when you come to a multiple, are a lot more attractive than they were two years ago. Um, so the issue is no longer can we sell the stores. The issue is who's got the bigger checkbook. And it's becoming serious numbers now. So um, that program will probably slow, but we haven't changed direction or, um, or intent. Uh, uh, looking at Starbucks, um, this is a cute little business. You know, I keep using the phrase, the phrase it, uh, in the office. It's, it's a really good little business. It's, uh, it's a sort of engine that just keeps chugging along and just keeps delivering consistent, strong EBITDAs year in and year out. Um, it's, uh, it's very stable for us. Um, it's, it's, Starbucks has got, a, got some good and bad points in its uh, heritage in New Zealand. 
Uh, it's had its rejectors. It's had its uh, its bad days. I think it's starting to enter a good a good phase now, where people are, are Starbucks uh, users. They just love the brand and they use it, and it doesn't really matter that it's not some snob coffee uh, made in Ponsonby. And, and they, it's convenient and, and it works for them. And, and I think Starbucks has got comfortable with that now. They're, they're no longer, well, we're no longer trying to be the best coffee operator out there. We've just got to be a good coffee operator, convenient, at a good price, and, uh, and, um, and just serve the customers in, in a fast, efficient way that, that suits their needs. Sure, Sunday morning might mean go to the, the, the flash coffee um, shop down the road but um, you know, if you're running between one place and another busy work day and you usually got time to go via Parnell, Ponsonby or you know, <coughs> visit some of the more yeah more gourmet coffee and, and, and uh, sort of shops so it's found its niche I believe I think it's it's in a, a good position we've got rid of some of the dog sites um, and the stores that are left are, are all performing well, profitable. Same store sales are growing. Um, and sales are slightly down, 0.4 of a, of a mill. But don't forget, we've closed five of the five stores that were underperformers. Challenges for Starbucks um, to maintain that growth. It's, it's uh, mid, um, about four, five, six percent same store sales growth, which is, is, is good for it. Good PRAs um, or per store average sales per week. Uh, we've closed those poorer, poorer performing stores. There's probably one one left to go out of the whole lot, and that's it's it's not a have to do it. It's just when the lease comes to an end, we'll uh, not renew, and we're getting back into refurbishing of stores. So St. Luke's, uh, Lynn Mall, are, are two recent ones. I think Sylvia Park's the next one on on the on the list to do. Um, and there's a bit of work to be done in the digital space. I suppose the brand to talk about is really Coles Jr. Um, at half year we had four stores. Today we've got eight. We opened one yesterday, Odahu. Um, for those of you who haven't visited Coles Jr., it's worth it. It's, uh, it's a great burger. It's, uh, if you haven't watched the advertising, it's seriously good advertising. Probably the best out there. Um, and it's, it's got something for everybody. So, yeah, there's a bit of blah blah about uh, you know, the type of ads they, they use in the States. And, and yes, yeah, some of them have been banned at the Super Bowl and, and various things like that. But uh, you can watch them on YouTube. But they also have ads that play in any other market in the world. So even if you, if you look at any of the New Zealand ads, um, I'd consider them pretty darn safe. But they, they got edge to them. They've just got that sexy edge, which, which gives a different message around um, the, the brand. And, uh, we, and we see it. We don't have to discount the burger. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's priced correctly for what it is. Uh, it's a burger that when you've eaten it, you're full, and, and I can honestly say that to any of you. If you're hungry, go to Coles Jr. and just have a standard burger, and I guarantee you, you will not be, be hungry. You, it's, it's good, solid, 100% Angus beef, no additives, made fresh to order, so it takes a little bit longer. You know, don't, uh, don't expect you know, instant service, because it doesn't come out of a warming drawer from a factory where it's pre-made and frozen and been sitting in a cooker for three hours. It's made when you order it. Um, but it's it's just it's a it's a wonderful brand to be involved with, and um, uh, yeah, I encourage you to to try it if you haven't yet. Challenges for the brand um, is just rolling out stores, finding sites. It's uh, it's tough finding sites, especially in, in the bigger areas, like Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch. Um, and as soon as we can find sites, we grab them, open open another store. Uh, target is six stores a year. If we can do 10, we will. If we can do 12, we will as well. But it's, uh, like I say, it's not a restriction on capital. It's more restriction on availability of a AA sites. Um, the, the sales, weekly sales, just to dimensionalize it, it's, it's a bigger, bigger sales brand than KFC per store. Um, so it gives you an idea. You know, we've said around 55, 60. The store we opened in Hastings uh, four weeks ago now, I think it was. I can believe Hastings was so successful. Um, over at, well, net off GST, uh, $185,000 in one week. Um, that's a world record. Uh, it's, it's just amazing how um, everybody enjoyed burgers. And the more amazing thing from our, from our side was how you could get so many people through the store 
through the drive-through and keep this, this engine running. It wasn't 24 hours, we opened at 9 and shut it by midnight. Um, uh, and, and to get $185,000 net uh, in, in, 12, uh, in, in seven days, it's, um, it's a really good effort and I think we've learned a lot as we've opened stores on how to run them. We, we've been very good at running KFCs and Pizza Huts, but running a, a, a fresh made to order burger operation is, is quite different so we've, we've had some subtleties and issues around how, how we set ourselves up and even though we, we brought on some some of the competitors whiz bang operators um, in the early days to uh, you know gave them jobs and paid them a bit more but um, they still just didn't get it and, and they struggled because the stuff wasn't pre-made frozen ready you know sitting in the warmer for two hours sort of stuff and, and they couldn't get this to work either so it's been a bit of a struggle but um, Hastings proves that we got it through and uh, <coughs> drive through again use of technology and use of a bit of innovative Kiwi thinking we got the drive through to uh, speeds that just outstripped anywhere else in the world that they've done so now they're coming back down here to annoy me to figure out how did you guys do that because obviously they get paid royalties on what the sales are so they would like to understand how they can lift average sales across the whole network globally um, a few other challenges on uh, localizing the brand from supplier's perspective. In the early days, some products were imported, or most of the products were. We, we're getting down to the stages where the, the more important um, items, ingredients are being localized, and, and that'll help bring food costs down. Uh, getting our head around the efficiencies and productivities and labor, which I spoke about, you know, getting a store like Hastings to work so efficiently has been a real education on, on, on how to set this thing up to work from a productivity perspective. And um, with that, we expect the EBITDAs and the, and the margins to, to start to flow through. Um, with, say, our target, initial target of 60 Carl's Jr. stores in New Zealand, Put that in perspective, there's, there's uh, 90, 99 KFCs, 160 McDonald's, I think, 165, 80 plus Burger King. So a target of 60 Carl's Juniors is pretty reasonable. Um, each doing you know, th $3 million. That's, that's a big brand. Another $200 million brand we'll have in the stable within the next five, six years. Um, on to just the, the outlook, the immediate outlook. Um, KFC's, uh, it's got this, it's, even though it's a limited growth, but it's consistent. It's, it's, that's what shareholders love us, is because it's just this consistent dividend. It's better than the bank. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't go up and down like interest rates do. This thing just keeps spitting. And um, we'll add another new store this year, um, and it'll just keep delivering good, solid cash. Uh, Pizza Hut, the process, as I mentioned, to continue that very slow sell down, but it's in a great space. It's making money, it's, it doesn't require a lot of investment. Our investment is going to Coles Jr. Um, we're, you know, we, we're intent on growing that to a $200 million business in New Zealand. And um, net profit off the tax, sort of indications, 18 to 19 million um, is, is what we're forecasting for the market. Otherwise, I think that's it. Yeah, so.